thrust pulls us through the air and fights all that pesky drag that our aircraft produces. And sometimes we need so much of it that a jet engine could be the size of an entire car. But what factors affect how much thrust we produce? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the fourth class in the performance series. Thrust is necessary for flight, but we don't want to use too much of it as this can cause a bit of unnecessary wear and tear on the engines. So we're going to take a look at all the external factors that affect how much thrust we produce so that we know just the right amount to use for the situation we're in. The way a jet engine works is fairly simple. We use the engine to accelerate at massive air backwards, then the reaction force to this acceleration of air is an opposite and equal force that we call thrust. And we can accelerate a large mass of air and therefore generate a large thrust, either by accelerating a small amount of air a lot, or we can accelerate a large amount of air by a little bit. Most modern jets use the latter of these methods. That's why they have such large intakes. They want to take in as much air as possible and they impart an acceleration onto it to create this thrust. In military aircraft though, often we see a small intake with a larger acceleration so that the aircraft engines and general profile of the plane can be a lot smaller. There are certain things to consider when talking about the thrust output of the engines. The first we're going to look at is the forward speed. So as we start to travel faster, we start to lose thrust. This is because we are generating thrust by accelerating a mass of air rearwards, and as the input speed of the air increases, the output speed of the air remains constant, so there's not that much difference. That means that as we travel faster, there's not as big of a difference, and we aren't accelerating it as much. We have a lower amount of thrust produced as a result, and we call this intake momentum drag. However, as we travel faster, the air in the engine intake starts to compress, this is called the ram effect. The air compressing in this way essentially means that the same mass of air is in a smaller volume. So by accelerating the same circular area of the engine intake, we're actually accelerating a larger mass of air as we travel fast. Thrust is all about mass acceleration. So if we travel faster, we gain more thrust from the engine because of the ram effect increasing uh, the air density essentially. This means that we cancel out the intake momentum drag and the thrust remains fairly constant with speed. In reality, there's actually a little bit of a dip, but for simplification purposes, think of thrust as a straight line across for a jet. This diagram would refer to a small military style engine, which we would call a low bypass engine. Commercial jets normally use a high bypass engine, um, which has a slightly different um, profile. A high bypass engine experiences intake momentum drag a lot more and the ram effect a lot less. So as we travel faster, we see a quick drop off in the thrust before it levels out. It would be something like this. This means that as we increase speed, especially in this region, we experience a large drop off in the amount of thrust we're getting until we reach this sort of steady condition. For example, the other day when I was taking off, we had about 91% power set, pretty close to the maximum which is what you'd expect on takeoff. You want full power to accelerate the aircraft quickly. When we were in the cruise though, flying at a high steady speed, the engines were set to 98% because they need to work harder at the high speed area to produce the thrust. Normally in performance, we use a low bypass engine for ease as there's a lot less difference with thrust and speed. Another factor that would have led to my engines working harder at um, the crew, when I was in the cruise would be the high altitude. So up at 30 or so thousand feet, the air is a lot less dense than at sea level. So in order to achieve the same mass acceleration through the engine, the engine has to uh, work harder than it does at sea level. Or for the same amount of engine setting in terms of percentage, we would get a lot less thrust in terms of actual force. So basically it would move these lines down it's all about mass acceleration through the engine and therefore it's all about the density of the air. So what else has an effect on air density? The temperature. So if it's warm, then the air is a lot less dense, everything expands. So we'll have a lower mass of air flowing through the engine per second at a certain percentage. And when it's colder, we would have a lot more dense air and therefore per second, 
there be um, a lot more uh, massive air flowing through the engine. So it has the same effect as altitude does. The normal limiting factor for how much thrust a jet engine can physically produce is the manufacturing of that engine. The temperature inside the turbine, which comes after the combustion chamber, can get extremely hot as it's located just after a chamber with loads of burning fuel in it. If it gets too hot, it can melt the blades in the turbine. So we're limited by how hot the turbine gas temperature can get or the TGT limit. We're also limited by the maximum RPM of the engine. If the RPM gets too high, then the centrifugal forces in the engine can get too high and it can basically tear the engine apart. If it's a really hot day, we normally reach the uh, turbine gas temperature limit before the RPM limit because the air is already hot, it's getting heated up more in the combustion chamber and therefore it's closer to that limit. On a colder day, we normally reach the RPM limit first because the air can be heated up in the combustion chamber without fear of it exceeding the TGT limit. So on a graph, it looks something like this. We have reducing thrust with increasing temperature. That's what we were talking about in the previous thing. Air density is reducing, so the amount of thrust available is reducing. Or you could think of it as with reducing temperature, the thrust is increasing. Beyond a certain limit though, the thrust output gets limited by the maximum RPM of the engine. We can't turn it any faster, so we can't produce um, as much thrust as we need at these cold temperatures, or we can't get any more. This means that beyond this temperature, let's call it, I don't know, 30 degrees or something like that, um, we can't get any additional benefits from flying in colder air because we are at our maximum RPM. So our thrust output, this line would become solid and we'd see a flat and then a decreasing level of thrust as the temperature increases. This would be called our flat rated temperature. Um, so for this engine, our flat rated temperature is 30 degrees. If it's lower than 30 degrees, we're not getting any more benefit from the temperature because we have to think about the RPM limit of our engine. On the graphs in the CAP698, it's often seen as a little kink in the graph wherever you are having to put in a temperature at an airport, for example, that kink in the graph is telling us that below this temperature, we're no longer getting any benefits from the engine for it being colder. Propellers generate a force through an aerodynamic reaction that is the same as lift, but instead of generating upwards, the propeller is mounted sideways to make this force a pose drag, and we call it thrust. The thrust is generated aerodynamically, so it therefore depends on the dynamic pressure of the air. If you need more informed propellers, then check out the propellers video in the performance uh, in the principles of flight series, sorry. Um, but basically, dynamic pressure is equal to a half rho v squared, rho being density. So we can say that in order to make this dynamic pressure higher, we need more density or we need more speed aka we need a higher mass flow rate, which is the same way a jet engine works. We are accelerating air behind us to generate a forward thrust force. Okay, so now that's established, we'll now take a look at some factors that influence the amount of thrust. So basically, as we travel faster through the air, we experience the same problem as a jet does as we fly faster. The input air to the propeller speeds up but the output speed remains the same, so we aren't accelerating the air as much. This acceleration is also to a much lower level than in a jet, so the air imparts a lower acceleration and it reduces as we get faster. It's that intake momentum drag. However, in a jet engine, we see that this intake momentum drag is counteracted by the ram effect. In a propeller, we don't get this ram effect, so as we travel faster, the thrust just reduces as we go. The other effects of temperature and altitude have the same effects as they would on a jet engine. Basically, denser air is better. So at high altitudes, we see a reduction in thrust, and at high temperatures, we see a reduction in thrust as well. This line would move down. Power is the rate of energy burn, energy over time. And thrust is a force, so they're not quite the same, although they are related. We can call energy a force multiplied by a distance. So we can make our equation for power and then we know that distance over time 
is the same as velocity. So we cancel these two out, make it velocity, and therefore power equals the force times the velocity or the speed, whatever you find easier to understand. If we take a look at a jet, first of all, we can see the relationship between thrust and power on a graph like this. We have roughly level thrust all through the range of speeds that we're flying at, and then we multiply the force by the speed we're going, so that would mean a linear ascending line like this for our power available from a jet and our thrust available there. In a propeller aircraft, the thrust reduces with increasing true airspeed, and we see a line for power available for a propeller, which looks like this, it's sort of a, a curved over line. Why do we even care about the amount of power though? Well, it's because we need to consider the power required to overcome the drag of the aircraft. If we have sufficient power available, then we will be able to overcome the drag and the power required. It's a bit of a strange thing, power required, but think of it as drag power, where power available is thrust times speed, power required is drag times speed. If we were in steady level flight, we know that thrust is equal to drag. So therefore, these two values for power required and power available would also need to be the same. Okay, so let's look at power required a bit more. So plotted on a graph, it looks fairly similar to a total drag curve because we're just multiplying it by the speed. Because this is a function of aircraft drag and nothing to do with the engine itself, there's no difference here between jets and propellers. The bottom of our graph for this speed would be our speed for minimum power and it occurs at 0 0.76 MD, MD being our speed for minimum drag. So why is any of this important? I said at the start of this little um, top down bit, but it's important because if we place our power available curve over the top of this power required graph, we see some fun things. So let's take a exaggerated uh, one for an engine, uh, a jet engine. So let's say this is our power available from a jet. We therefore see that we have sufficient power available to fly at all these speeds in this range here. But as soon as we go outside, we need more power here than we've actually got available on the jet engine. So we, we wouldn't be able to fly whatever speed that is equal to. So we have a flight envelope created by the amount of power available versus the power required. And say it was a really hot day and we have the same aircraft, we'd see that this line um, would be a bit shallower, something like that maybe, on a hot day. Then instead of having this full range of speeds here, we're now only able to fly in this little range of speeds in here because we don't have sufficient power available. So that was a quick overview of thrust. Um, obviously the way that thrust is generated depends on the engine. Engines are a lot more complicated than I've just made out here. Um, I've not done any videos on engines yet, but it's something we'll get to in the future. But it's basically all about mass flow acceleration to generate thrust. And jets can either accelerate a small amount of volume quite quickly, which is a low bypass, or a large amount of volume a little bit, which is high bypass. Both of these will experience intake momentum drag. So as the aircraft flies faster, the output remains the same, but we have the input increasing. So it's a lower level of acceleration. So that would reduce our thrust as we fly faster. In a jet engine though, it's counteracted by the ram effect. Ram effect basically means that the engine coming in is squeezed together, artificially raising the density, and it balances out when we see this is supposed to be a flat line for jet uh, thrust as we travel faster. And the density change is all what's important here. That will change the mass flow rate and that will mean that the acceleration of the air is different. So anything which reduces the density is going to reduce our level of thrust available. Basically, if the temperature increases, expands everything out, thrust goes down. If the altitude increases, again, stuff's less dense and the amount of thrust comes down. And jet engines will be limited by either um, turbine gas temperature, TGT, or RPM. And below a certain temperature, the RPM limit is reached first. And any benefits from colder, more dense air are not felt as the RPM limit 
is sort of enforced to keep the engine safe. Propeller thrust experiences, well propellers in general, experience the intake momentum drag, but they don't have the benefit of ram effect. So we see a reducing thrust with speed, sort of a slight S shape because of uh, levels of efficiency. And propellers suffer from the same uh, density considerations. If it's high temperature, we get less thrust. Again, this line would just move down. And if we're at a higher altitude, we also get less thrust. This would move down. Power available is not drag time speed. It's thrust time speed. I've done that wrong. And that one's drag time speed. So power available is thrust time speed. Power required is drag time speed. We basically need to have sufficient power available to overcome power required. And the speed for minimum power would be VMP. And that happens at 0.76 VMD, the speed for minimum drag. And this is important because it gives us a window of speeds that we can fly in. And if we have less thrust available, it manipulates our power available line. And that means our power required line stays the same. And that means that our envelope, our area where we can actually fly reduces. So if we understand that, we can fly at safe speeds. We know what we're able to do. Whereas if we ignored it, we would maybe try and fly too fast or too slow and the aircraft wouldn't be able to perform.